What is up guys, in this video we'll be going from this to this. Fully functional CarPlay with our Eonon Q49 Pro Android infotainment system. Huge thanks to Eonon for sponsoring this video and sending out the handy unit for me to install. Links to all these parts will be in the description below, be sure to check them out. Alrighty guys, so opening the first box of Neonon, the Q49 Pro, we have the unit itself at the very base over here, which looks almost identical to the stock unit, which I love because it gives sort of an OEM plus sort of look. Take a better look at that. You can see that looks almost the same as the stock screen, which is great. Um, there's a screen protector on here from factory, so we can leave that on until we're done with the install. Uh, but yeah, very similar bezel, similar design overall. This is a touch screen, of course, which is fantastic. We also have an owner's manual here with some various instructions, whatever troubleshooting you may have, as well as a little instruction booklet for the reverse camera, which will come in handy a bit later. And of course, we have all of the wiring harnesses necessary and needed if you have an E39 that has the base radio or professional CD, something like that. Basically, if you do not have the 16x9 widescreen, you'll be using this harness. Taking a better look at the harness itself, here we have a CAN bus decoder. This allows for stuff like steering wheel controls and whatnot. Here we have a older style connection for the older BMW radios like in the pre-LCI 839. Here we have stuff for newer cars like mine. Um, if you guys have an LCI 839, you most likely will have this. Here we have some connections for various audio inputs and outputs. Here we have a connection for a backup camera. Now this is very optional as well. However, we'll be installing a backup camera from Eonon in this video, so be sure to stay tuned for that. And all these little white connectors will go into the back of the unit. Now, each of these small white connectors are actually different shapes and different pinouts, so there's only one way to put them in, which makes it very easy because you cannot install the wrong one in the wrong slot. However, if you, like me, have the stock navigation screen, the big 16x9 screen in your car, you're going to need an extension harness because all of your radio components are actually in the back of the car at the trunk on the left side. Um, so you'll need an extension harness to run all the way from the front of the car to the back. So I'll be doing that in this video and I'll show you guys every step of the way. And this massive harness is what you're going to need to install this Android unit if you're choosing to use it with a car that has the uh, navigation screen from factory like mine, the stock BMW system of course, uh, because all of your components are in the trunk of the car like I mentioned earlier. Same thing as the other harness, just much longer. And there will be some things we must transfer from the uh, standard harness to this longer harness to make sure everything works together nicely. The rest of the box contains stuff like a connector for your radio. If your radio is in the car instead of in the trunk, you'll be using this. But like I said earlier, because we have the trunk mounted components, we will not be using this. We also get this guy right here. It's an external microphone. Now, I'm not going to use this because the Unon unit actually already has a microphone in the front of it. So I don't need to use this, but uh, you may want to if you want to have even better sound quality, but I'm not too concerned about that. Here's one of the USB ports. Uh, one is for CarPlay, one is not. Although I'm pretty sure you can use either for either purpose, but uh, for the sake of it, you can see there's also a little connector there that goes to the back of the Eonon unit. Here is the second USB, like I said. You can keep these behind the display or run them to somewhere accessible in the car. It's fully up to you. Um, or you can run an iBus dongle, which I'll be talking about later, and I will be buying for this unit separately. That'll be a separate video altogether, so stay tuned for that. The iBus lets you do really cool stuff like control lighting and control various elements of the car that you couldn't before. Here are some brackets and tools you'll need to install the unit if you have the normal radio and not the factory widescreen. This right here is a GPS antenna. Now the factory unit actually does have an antenna already built into it. The unit I mean by this one actually. Um, so you don't actually need to use this if you don't really care so much for it. Um, I'll be using mainly Apple CarPlay with this unit so I'm not super concerned about that. But if you like to use this you can. It's very simple to install. This simply screws onto the back of the unit and you can place this wherever you'd like. There's also one more adapter here for radio if you choose to use your own antenna instead, um, but you shouldn't need this if you're not going to be doing that. Next up, we've got some more Yonan accessories. Over here we have an OBD2 adapter, which we can use with the Android unit to scan various error codes and get live data from the vehicle. Pretty cool. Like I said earlier, links to everything you see in this video will be in the description below, so be sure to check that out for whatever you may want. This box contains the backup camera I mentioned earlier. So this camera is not specific to this chassis, however, it does work with this unit. Um, I could not find a camera that actually works specifically with E39, but my plan is to kind of screw this guy in to the trunk latch area um, and uh, make it as invisible as possible. I want to make it as seamless as it can be. And with that, um, this is a harness as well. 
that extends all the way from the uh, license plate area to the very front of the car if you choose to install a backup camera. I'll be doing this of course, so I'll be kind of wiring this alongside that large harness to get the back of the car. So on the harness that came with the unit, I needed we wanted to unplug the canvas decoder like so, as well as these lines over here. You can see one is labeled brake. We'll unplug that by pulling apart. And also the one labeled amp control. Nice, so now we actually don't even need this anymore because now all of this is essentially in this massive thing. So we can put this aside. We don't need this for the rest of the video. All right, so look at what we've got now. We can take our long harness, we can connect this to our canvas decoder. It's the only one that fits. Just like that. We can take our amp control wire, connect it up to this one over here from our original. Just like that. Perfect. And our brake wire, which connects to this over here for the rear view camera. Nice, and now that's actually ready to go. So we don't need to do anything more. That was all it took. Um, this will all go on the side, inside the car where our Ian and Ian will sit, and that will go to the trunk. To begin removing the stock screen from the car, we have to remove the bezel first, this little plastic piece that goes around the screen. There's a few clips that kind of hold it in place. I'm using a trim tool just like this to kind of slot below and uh, release the tabs as we go. But once I do that, the whole trim piece should come off, which will expose some screws to remove the screen itself. Once enough tabs are popped, you can see it pretty much just slides on out. And there it is, no tabs are broken, and we're all set to continue removing the stock screen. With that trim off, we can see a few screws that go around the perimeter of the screen. You'll see, first of all, there's gonna be some black screws on the sides, so one there, one there, one there, one there, so two black screws on each side, remove those. And then also remove the bronzes, silver colored screws, one at each top corner, one there, one there, and two at the bottom, kind of off center, one towards the left side, one kind of towards the middle, and that's it. There's nothing else there. Once all eight screws are taken care of, the whole unit will simply pull on out with no resistance whatsoever. Just be very careful of your gear lever, and there are two connections at the very back of the unit. Here's the back of the screen. Like I said, just two connectors right there. You're going to press on those tabs and then push the black collar all the way back, and connectors release themselves. Next up is to remove this kick panel down here below the steering wheel, kind of where the brakes and accelerator pedal are. Ignore the fact that I'm missing a dead pedal here. There's usually a little bit of plastic assembly with a dead pedal and a little plastic trim over here. Mine unfortunately cracked a little bit ago and I haven't replaced it yet. Um, but normally you'd have a piece here, in which case you'd have a Phillips head screw right over there. But instead I just have the ones over here, one, two, and three. And then of course we also have a couple of uh, twist tabs back here. Just simply twist them to the left and that loosens them up all together and that whole panel will come down once we take those Phillips head screws out. In the core of the panel, there are a few connectors that need to come out of that little piece over there. Once those are out, the entire kick panel can now be removed. The next panel to remove is the entire lower dashboard on the driver's side over here. So we're gonna remove this entire panel, which means undoing all the Phillips head screws that are associated with it, which first requires removing this trim panel over here, as well as the one on the other side of the steering wheel, which both come off with a trim removal tool. Um, just need to pry it on the little sides over here and gently wiggle it out. It does take quite a bit of force, and these can break as they're basically just plastic or wood veneer, depending on what you have. So be very careful when doing so. All right, so with those trim panels removed, you'll see we got two Phillips screws over here. There's actually one hiding over there in the middle of the screen over there. And on this side, we've got two as well. Although just gonna remove the one that's actually on that panel. This one is actually on this panel, which we don't need to remove. There's also one screw hiding between the middle of the car and the trim piece over there. You can see the middle of the screen, as well as one below the steering wheel. It's actually a plastic screw, and once you release it, an entire clip comes out and the trim can release. In fact, I should clarify, this trim piece actually includes the entire bottom half of the steering column. So that all comes out in one go. It's just connected by tabs up here that need to be kind of snapped out of place once you get all those Phillips screws out, of course. With all those out, the entire panel will drop like this. Next thing we gotta do is undo the OBD2 port. So that means releasing this lock, pulling up, 
And if you open the port from the other side, plastic cap, and you can push the port on through. Off side like so, and this whole panel can now be put aside. And now you can see we have very easy access between both sides of the dashboard, which means we can get our harness all the way through to this side where the screen lives, all the way back to that area over there, which we can see some wires going down behind the carpet. We're gonna follow those wires with our wiring harness for the Android screen, the unknown unit, and we'll follow it all the way back to the rear of the car. All right, so to summarize, we're gonna have the wires come from the center of the dash area where the screen lives, all the way down here, and then we're gonna feed it through the carpet over there. We're gonna have it come out around over here and just kinda of have it follow this kick panel. We're gonna remove this kick panel, of course. Have it follow this, follow the trim down over here as well, all the way to the back door. We're gonna lift up this trim piece as well. The wire harness is gonna fall away all the way through. Don't mind that disgustingly old and dirty floor mat. Then we'll pop the seat up. There's some little tabs. You can move the seat pretty easily. Um, depends if you have the optional folding rear seats or not. My car does, which makes it quite a lot easier. But if you don't, you'll wanna remove the bottom bench seat as well as the back. I can just fold mine down. There's a little passageway that actually feeds through behind this guy over here all the way to the trunk. All of my car's trunk modules live behind the driver's side taillights. So the DVD player, the, the radio, and also the navigation system all live in this corner right over here. For an M5, your radio is gonna be in the very trunk, in the very middle part of the trunk. Um, but other than that, they're all gonna be over here or the middle of the trunk with the battery for the M5. So yeah, this one panel right here, just kind of pop right out. Pretty fragile, pretty brittle. It can crack very easily. If you guys saw already earlier, mine was actually already pretty broken. It's due for replacement, so I'll be replacing that very soon. Don't mind the, you know, disgusting carpet right now. It has to be cleaned. Um, but yeah, everything else is pretty much just a bunch of tabs. Um, over there, if you still have your dead pedal in place, which you should, unlike me, it'll be also just a bunch of plastic tabs. And you'll have to pull off the actual handle. There's a, there's a Phillips head screw that sits right in there. You have to take this handle off to remove that whole uh, dead pedal panel. Once that's all off, you can see now we can actually lift the carpet up a good amount um, and actually fold it back to expose where all those wires are going, which is right down there. And they simply follow a channel that goes down below here. If you stick your finger in here, you can feel there's a perfect channel to fit our harness for our Eon stereo right in here, which is gonna be great, which goes all the way down to the back. You can see over here, I've removed, partially removed rubber seals for the doors. I've also removed the trim for the seat, which is not necessary, but it'd be easier for you guys to see this. Um, and I can pop this panel off as well, which was also just by, by a bunch of uh, little plastic tabs. You can see over there, one of those plastic tabs. Very, very straightforward. Coming to the back of the car, you can see that exact same panel right over here, also popped out. Uh, very similar panel to the front over here, except there's actually a bolt tying it in, which is below this seat. So regardless if you have the bench seat or if you have the foldable seats, this bottom bench will need to pop out. You gotta grab it below like this, pull up, and it'll be kind of a violent sort of popping sound. That means you've released the clip. We can actually kind of pull it forwards now, above that seat belt buckle. Yep, and then we can see below here, there's that trim panel. And looking below the seat, you can see a little nut down there that holds both this bottom panel and this side bolster of the seat in place. If you guys have the fixed uh, backrest for your seats, that is a little bit different removal process. There's a few bolts I want to say. I don't exactly know because I don't have that type of configuration, but in my car at least, I can simply fold this seat down and I can get better access to pull this part off. Similarly to how that bottom bench popped out, we will simply pop this top part out. There's also a clip just like that. You can see this is kind of where it slots in and here's the clip itself. And of course, a bunch of wires and such. But down here, right behind this little trim, is where our harness will feed through. We'll take that grommet out, we'll make a slot in it, and we can slot our harness through there, which will then get us to the trunk, which is exactly where we want to be. Now to get better access to this, we'll pull these clips out, just these two ones over here, um, which are pretty simple. Just a flat screwdriver will pull the center part out, and the whole clip would come out. And then we can actually put the harness right through there. But to make life easier, I'll take the 10 mil out right now, which is somewhere down there, and that'll make it easier to remove that trim piece, which will make the whole process quite a bit easier. 
Here we can see you've got that whole panel pulled forwards. And I'm just using ratchet to get that one 10 millimeter nut off, which will loosen this piece as well as the bottom trim panel down there. Alrighty, so with it all removed, we can see a pretty good clear access to everything that's been going on. And now we can get our new harness and start putting it through everything. Let's not forget our backup camera harness as well, as that also needs to go to the same place. Um, and uh, we'll get back to this part of the car later when the time comes. In the trunk of the car, on the side where the navigation module is in my case, I'm going to pull this little cover off, which exposes our CD changer, our radio, our navigation com computer, as I said earlier, and our DSP amplifiers. Now, this area right over here is where our wires were going to come out. You can remove this tab over there, a little push clip, we'll pull it out, this whole thing will come forwards, which will then give us access to where those wires come out from. Now, if you look over here as well, this quad lock connector is what other E39s will have in the front of the car. We have it back here, and this is what will plug into our harness. Then, of course, this connector over here will extend our radio signal to our new unit. With those clips out of the way, this whole carpet piece, as I was suggesting, pushes forwards. We can see this little grommet over here. We can actually just pull it right on out of here and give us some room to work with which is pretty neat because look at that that's a plenty of space now to fit our harness through to the trunk just to give you guys a better look that's what the other side looks like it goes right through that little hole made for wiring right over there and all the way to the very back which is where we're going to find our plugs for our radio and navigation and whatnot all right, so I've got these connectors and quite a lot of access on this side so far. I simply pushed a little bit through there, and on this side, I was able to see that harness poke out from over here, right there, a little braided cable there, and I was able to sneak all those through here and get those through to right over here, which is where I'm at right now. The next step will be getting this all below the carpet, um, but I might just put this also directly towards the front of the car and then tuck in this harness as I go at the very end. So that's what I'm at right now. So far, it's pretty easy. Um, nothing too difficult in the way. Um, getting these guys through um, this section might be a little bit challenging, but overall, not too bad at all. All right, so I'm back here. I'm going to connect the appropriate connectors from our old radio, the BM5453, depending which, where you live. Uh, this is the actual antenna to the, to the top of the car. This is the actual massive plug for our block connector over here. You'll see we have styles for the newer style, like what I have over here, and the older style, like for the older uh, pre-LCI BMW 5 series. So we'll do that now. Um, pretty simple to do this. You're going to push a tab on the radio over here to get that off. This will go into this black plug over here for the new harness. And then over there, that'll plug into one of these guys, I believe, um, the square pin connector over here. And then this one will actually plug back into our radio just to be the full loop. Now, um, these two will not be used. Probably this one will not be used because it's the older style one. We're going to have it just kind of sitting back here. Here we have our car's harness. We have to do our new harness over here. The reinstallation for this kind of connector is the exact same process of removal, just the reverse. You have to let it be all the way open, slide it in, and as you close the connector, as you close this sort of lock, it pulls it all together. Okay, so with our antenna reconnected, you can see over there, as well as our harness on the new harness side, as well as on the actual radio side, we can get rid of all this slack. We can pull on that cable over there and move on to the front of the car. Thought I'd point out, I pushed this grommet back into place. Everything's nice and sealed like it was before. We can put this back, but I won't do it until the installation is complete just to make sure everything is all sort of nice and tidy. Now that our harness is nicely in place, all the way from the back of the car, all that's left to do is connect it all to our Eonon Q49 Pro. As we can see, I've already connected all those connectors already. It's as simple as just seeing what fits where. Because like I said earlier, they're all unique shapes and they cannot be mixed up. So that makes this all very, very easy, which is nice. Um, I've got the USB ports and all that stuff. I've got the GPS antenna, even though I said I wouldn't be using it very much. It is still there because there's plenty of space to work with, which is nice. And uh, yeah. So take a look at that. We have our nice harness coming out to this little grommet over here. It goes then below the seat, the rear seat, and then it goes below this trim over here, which is not in place yet. And then like I was mentioning earlier, it just simply follows that path and 
keeps going, keeps going. It's all below here. You can kind of see it right down there. And it comes up in that area. This will all be covered by the kick, uh, sort of kick plate over there. That black panel that sits right over there. It goes up into the dash and, of course, to our lovely screen, Eon Q49 Pro, which is not fully installed. It's just kind of sitting in place. Um, but we're missing one thing, which is the backup camera harness. Now, like I said, this Eon camera is not exactly made for a specific car. It's sort of a general mount camera. So I have to drill into some parts of the car. Now, I don't really want to drill into the metal as that can cause rust and such like that. But as you can see, my uh, my rear license plate lights are not factory. They're pretty aftermarket. Overall, everything's pretty rough back here. <laughs> it needs a little bit of a refresh, as you guys can tell. But I will likely either drill into the light itself, which is already damaged because I can at least test fit things, or I'll mount it inside the trunk latch instead. I can probably make it a flush mount and remove that bracketing. So we'll see whatever works best. I will show you whatever I end up doing. Uh, but regardless, the wiring for the camera will go through the trunk lid. It's gonna come out and be visible from down here. And we'll connect that all the way to that little sleeve over there, which will then make its way back over here, like I said earlier, and tap into power over here for your reverse taillight bulb. On the camera itself, there are two wires that come off of it. This white yellow one is the RCA video cable that goes to the head unit. This red one over here is for power. If you take a look at the harness for the backup camera, you'll see that we have the same sort of style RCA video connector and of course the power connector. And the power connector just kind of goes off to red and black leads which then are supposed to go to your taillight uh, bulb for power, of course. We'll just tap into those with some normal T-taps, and that should be good enough. And then the other side of that cable is this yellow RCA jack as well, which will plug directly into the head unit. This right here is the trigger wire. Um, now, I don't think we'll get any of this because we do have Canvas, um, the Canvas decoder, so hopefully we won't need to use it. We're going to find out very soon. So I've wired the back of camera harness all the way from the head unit in the exact same way we wired the rest of the harness all the way from over there, below the steering wheel, along all the side panels over here, and we come all the way to the back seat like we were before. Except now, instead of going all the way to that uh, driver's side taillight, we're gonna go through over here, same little area where that little grommet is. We're gonna go up above in the trunk. You can see there's some holes there. And we're gonna stretch all the way across to the very other side of the car, in which case we're gonna pull the wires out from over there then we can meet ourselves at the trunk we can wire up from over here through this little cabling harness that goes to the trunk lid itself which is where we'll access our camera and then we can get power from our reverse taillight on this side of the car so so far as you can see i've kind of got this tidied up but we've got the wire traveling all the way through these little holes in the part of the chassis of the car and they go right over here and i have to remove this little trim piece over here just like we did on that side same exact clips, just a different time again over here. We're going to flip this whole uh, gray carpeting forward so we can swap the wires all the way down towards the battery of the car, which is also next to the taillight. And over there, we can then power the uh, camera um, with the reverse tail, like I mentioned earlier. And we can also run the RCA cable up to the camera, which will be in the trunk lid through that little grommet. So I was able to jam the wires through there. You can see they come all the way right over here. So now we need to get the RCA cable and the power cable, um, as well as part of the power cable as well, through this area over here, which will be nice and complicated because this grommet is very old, as yours probably is as well, and dried out and just overall pretty gross. So we're gonna remove the grommet altogether by kind of just pulling at it and kind of squeezing like that. And then you can see over here, you can do the same thing. So we're gonna to wanna to push it back through the hole. It can come out through there, it's kind of hard to see, but that's where the grommet um, actually starts. And we can push the wires in with a uh, stick of some sort, and that will make things quite a lot easier. As for mounting your rearview camera, there are a few ways of doing this. Now, the simplest way of mounting the A0125 in a rearview camera would be to utilize this bracket it has in the picture over here and simply screw it into either um, kind of the trunklet area or one of the license plate lights. Now, I personally prefer a more flush mounted look. I was not a big fan of it just sticking out like this. So my plan is to take the camera. I took off the uh, bracket at the back. So this wire is the top of the camera. So it should be facing this way towards the rear of the car. My idea was to take my trunk latch like this. You can see it's actually not in the best condition. This is the original trunk latch, but it still functions. And I think it'll serve the purpose for what I'm about to do. My plan is to drill a hole in the back of that latch have the wires for the camera 
these two guys come out over here and have the camera sit in this latch nice and flush. Kind of like an OEM camera would look on a newer BMW or Mercedes. So that's my plan. I'm going to show you guys how I do it. And if you guys want to replicate this, feel free to do so. Um, there are many other cameras available as well, but this one has a nice wide angle. I've already tested it to make sure it works when the car is in reverse, and it does. And so we'll be doing it this way, and then the latch will mount to the car um, just like it would normally. Now, to remove this latch, it's pretty simple, actually. You'd actually just use a flathead screwdriver. You kind of pry around it, and it just pops out. And um, you have to take some, to some trim off in the trunk. I'll show you guys when I'm putting this back in. It's very simple, it's just a bunch of clips and at most a few Phillips head screws. And um, the whole thing releases to reveal this. Um, the next video I'll show you guys, I'll be showing you guys the wiring I've gotten in the trunk lid itself. Getting it through that, that uh, rubbery piece, which I showed you in the previous clip, was pretty difficult. Um, I actually had to slice it open in some areas just so I could get it through, which is not ideal for the sake of weatherproofing. Um, I am probably going to find something else that will that'll solve that to that area there. Even if it means buying a new that new grommet piece and utilizing that still. I just think mine's pretty old, and it made things a lot harder. So it'll be okay, uh, not ideal, but I can still wrap it up and make it look clean. Um, as for the wires in the trunklet itself, they have to reach a certain point behind sort of the endoskeleton of the trunk. I'll show you guys what I mean to get to these wires. Now these are actually pretty long, and these will do a pretty good job getting us to where we need to go. Um, but for now, I'm going to get this mounted inside here. I'm going to use some uh, JB Clear Weld. It's a two-part epoxy you have to mix together. I usually use a popsicle stick, and I'll mount it in here. And uh, to seal the back um, of the, uh, what we could do with the hole for the wiring, I'll use some silicone just to, uh, or some RTV gasket maker just to make it sort of more sealed. Alrighty, guys, current status update. We got the camera mounted in the car, looking nice and good. Nice and flush mounted there. It looks like an OEM camera. Come then over here, we have our wiring set up. So we have clearly the wire is going to the reverse connector or the actual taillight harness for the reverse power and trigger. I'll show you guys that earlier. Have that going up to that grommet I showed you guys earlier to power our harness. And of course we have our RCA and power connector over here. I simply extended the uh, power lines that were initially over here all the way down the harness over here. It's a little bit extra effort, but not too bad overall. Did not take very much time. And then I have those guys coming out over here. And now this tube, I'm going to actually zip tie or tape these guys to. So I'll tape these connectors to this tube. And I have this tube coming all the way through the trunk, through the little skeleton of it, coming out over there. And there we have the connectors for the camera. So then once I pull the connectors through, I can connect it up, and then it will have a fully working and fully installed camera. At that point, I'll just bring the interior back together between the trunk and the rest of our interior and our installation is nearly complete. And my trunk is basically back in one piece. Just wanna show you guys for this little uh, harness over here, this little covering. I put this special tape, which is heat resistant and water resistant over this. It's meant for engine bays and stuff like that. I've used that to rewrap several harnesses in the engine bay that have just kind of deteriorated. And this stuff actually works pretty well, even on rubber. So good to know. I'll link it in the description below. It is pretty good. Looks, uh, you know, pretty unobtrusive. Obviously not the rubber stuff that was originally there, um, although it's still there below it, obviously. Um, but it, it is served the purpose and looks pretty, uh, pretty clean. So I'll put that in the description below, like I said, and uh, you might need that if you need to be doing cutting this open like that. Before we finalize our installation, we need to remove the stock bracket for the stock navigation system and install these brackets that came with the kit. I thought we wouldn't need to use these, but we actually do. It's not a perfect fit with the stock bracket. Plus, if you guys have the base stereo, it'll be the exact same process for you guys. You'll be using these as well. Basically, it's going to go on either side, kind of similar to how this holes over there in each corner. We want the same thing as the mounting units, mounting points for the Enon unit are in the top right and left corners. It also comes with a bunch of hardware, which we'll be using as well. Should be relatively straightforward. Just going to take this whole one out first, which is just a lot of Phillips head screws. Looks like these two screws also behind the trim will need to be removed to fully remove this bracket. So I've gotten the brackets lined up now. You're gonna to wanna to remove this hardware actually from the stock unit. You're not gonna use this at all. You have to drill into the dash a bit. You have to move these a bit down below. So unfortunately that these brackets won't actually line up directly with um, the stock holes because just how it's designed. So you'll have to drill into the dash with these original screws that came with your car. 
um, and just kind of go all the way down as far as you can. I kind of mounted it flush with this area where the trim goes, same on both sides. And now it lines up perfectly with the screen. So I'm gonna plug everything back in the screen and screw it into these holes right over here. There are two screws for the screen that look just like this. And once those are in, you can uh, put the plastic caps back on. Now that our Eon Q49 Pro is fully installed in this 5 Series, we can take a closer look at all its functionality. Big thanks again to Eon for sponsoring this video and supplying me with this head unit. If you would like to purchase this unit, take a look at my affiliate link in the description below. It would definitely help out the channel if you guys do. I get a small kickback from that for sure, so definitely check that out. So, first off we have this row of default icons which are shortcuts to certain functions. On the right we have the radio, and then we have navigation, music, and the time. The radio works flawlessly just as the radio worked with the original system, no signal issues at all, it works pretty well with its own presets. The navigation icon can be linked to your navigation app of choice, like Google Maps or Waze or whatever you'd like. In my case, I actually have it linked to my Apple CarPlay, um, which makes things pretty easy. In fact, also my navigation button up here is also linked to CarPlay, which makes things even easier. Um, and in fact, having the physical buttons makes things just a lot better. In general, I think it's very pretty correct. It also just makes navigating the whole system quite a lot easier, just having shortcuts everywhere you look. The menu button on this side over here will always take you back to the home screen no matter where you are. For example, over here, press menu, you go back to your home screen. You would have numbered buttons over here for your radio presets, just like the original BMW system. The volume and tuner knobs work as just as you expect. Um, there's also a mute button over here you can press, which makes things nice and easy as well. In addition, I should mention that the lighting for behind all the keys, the backlighting for all of them, actually matches the OEM BMW stuff very well. In fact, you look at my climate vents down here, you can probably barely see those, but it matches the same coloration perfectly, so it makes things look even more OEM, which is great. A nice little touch over the OEM system is that there's actually some lighting behind the volume knob and tuner knob. The OEM system did not have that, but this one does, and it matches everything else perfectly, which is pretty cool. And on top of all that, because this really is an Android device at its core, you can download any Android app from Google Play Store you could possibly want. For example, here's Instagram. I mean, the sizing might look a little weird just being in this orientation, but it works flawlessly. I mean, here's my most recent post with the E39. Um, pretty cool. Everything works as you'd expect. I mean, having an Instagram app on your 21-year-old car with an OEM-looking system is pretty cool, in my opinion. If you swipe up, you get this app drawer with all your apps on the device. I only have installed a few that aren't standard with this device, like Netflix and YouTube, and I put it in of course. Then there's this app called Torque, which when you connect it to an OBD device that actually came with this unit, I actually unboxed at the very beginning, you can get live data like uh, acceleration, you can get RPMs, you can get all this different stuff, even fault codes. If you have a check engine light, you can scan it live with this app, which is pretty awesome as well. Now, let's talk CarPlay and Android Auto. You'll want to use a pre-installed app called T-Link, which I have down here. Well, by default, it'll be behind a menu over here. You can see T-Link is actually right over here. You tap on that, you get CarPlay that boots right up. So if you've never paired your device before, it'll ask you to basically pair it via Bluetooth first and then be able to connect it automatically via Wi-Fi. And you get this menu just like this. And this is obviously wirelessly connected. So once you connect it for the first time uh, you ever do, it'll automatically connect whenever you get in the car, which is pretty nice, just like a brand new car would, which is pretty awesome, like I said, in a 21-year-old BMW. That is something you don't see every day, but it's nice to have for sure. Pressing this car button takes you back to the OEM system. But if you press on either the navigation button, in my case, or that, it'll take you right back to CarPlay, which is pretty sweet. It works as you expect. In fact, very smoothly, I would say, for as far as CarPlay goes. CarPlay itself is always the smoothest in the world, but this device is pretty good at making it as smooth as possible with the touchscreen, of course. Um, and of course, you get Spotify, you get whatever you want, and it all shows up here. And it all works with the steering wheel controls as well, which is awesome. So the uh, volume controls work, as well as the skip track and next track button also work on the steering wheel. As for Android Auto, I'm not too familiar with how that works, although I'm sure it is a very similar process to the setup. I'm not sure if that is wired only or wireless as well, but I think it should be both. Um, I just, I'm not entirely sure as I've never used it before. Other very cool things to mention about this unit are because of the canvas integration, you can use the steering wheel buttons to control your volume as well as next track and previous track, which is pretty awesome. Um, as well as when you open the doors, it actually displays a little message on the screen like this. If you watch this, it shows a little device over there. Of course, as soon as I close the door, that goes away, or I can even tap on it and it'll go away. But it is pretty nice to have that feature, not something you see in all types of cars these days. Also pretty neat is you put the car in reverse, just like so.
your backup camera will automatically pop up. Uh, the one we just installed actually is working flawlessly, as you can see, which is pretty cool. And as soon as you put the car back in drive or neutral or whatever your car has, it goes back to what it was before. In an upcoming video, I'll be talking to you guys about the iBus module I've installed in this car, which complements the Android unit perfectly. Um, and you can see over here is the iBus app as well. There is so much functionality you can unlock by using this app and the module with an Android unit, such as this Xenon Q49 Pro. It's really cool, but there's so much to talk about that'll be a separate video altogether. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Anyways, guys, I hope this video was helpful. Leave a like if you did like it, and consider subscribing for more E39 content, among other German car related things. And that's it for now, but see you guys in the next one. Well, first off, I should mention that the E39 is from BMW's golden age of vehicles. You have the cars with the Z8, the E46 M3, the E38 uh, 7 Series, the first gen E53 X5, and of course the wonderful E39 the 5 Series. This includes the M5 and, of course, the inline 6 models with the 525, 528, and 530, like this.